Story ten of Wounds in the Rain War Stories by Stephen Crane. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story ten War Memories Part three. On the day before the destruction of Servara's fleet, I steamed past our own squadron, doggedly lying in its usual semicircle, every nose pointing at the mouth of the harbour. I went to Jamaica, and on the placid evening of the next day I was again steaming past our own squadron, doggedly lying in its usual semicircle, every nose pointing at the mouth of the harbour. A megaphone hail from the bridge of one of the yacht gunboats came casually over the water. Hello? Hear news? No. What was it? The Spanish fleet came out this morning. Oh, of course it did. Honest, I mean. Yes, I know. Well, where are they now? Sunk. Was there ever such a preposterous statement? I was humiliated that my friend, the lieutenant on the yacht gunboat, should have measured me as one likely to swallow this bad joke. But it was all true, every word. I glanced back at our squadron, lying in its usual semicircle, every nose pointing at the mouth of the harbour. It would have been absurd to think that anything had happened. The squadron hadn't changed a button. There it sat, without even a smile on the face of the tiger and it had eaten four armored cruisers and two torpedo-boat destroyers while my back was turned for a moment. Courteously, but clearly, we announced across the waters that until dispatch-boats came to be manned from the ranks of the celebrated horse-marines, the lieutenant's statement would probably remain unappreciated. He made a gesture, abandoning us to our skepticism. It infuriates an honourable and serious man to be taken for a liar or a joker at a time when he is supremely honourable and serious. However, when we went ashore, we found Siboni ringing with the news. It was true, then, that mishandled collection of sick ships had come out and taken the deadly thrashing which was rightfully the due of, well, I don't know, somebody in Spain or perhaps nobody anywhere. One likes to wallop incapacity, but one has mingled emotions over the incapacity which is not so much personal as it is the development of centuries. This kind of incapacity cannot be centralized. You cannot hit the head which contains it all. This is the idea, I imagine, which moved the officers and men of our fleet. Almost immediately they began to speak of the Spanish admiral as poor old boy, with a lucid suggestion in their tones that his fate appealed to them as being undue, hard, undue, cruel. And yet the Spanish guns hit nothing. If a man shoots, he should hit something, occasionally, and men say that from the time the Spanish ships broke clear of the harbour entrance, until they were one by one overpowered, they were each a band of flame. Well, one can only mumble out that when a man shoots he should be required to hit something occasionally. In truth, the greatest fact of the whole campaign on land and sea seemed to be the fact that the Spaniards could only hit by chance, by a fluke. If he had been an able marksman, no man of our two unsupported divisions would have set foot on San Juan Hill on July 1st. They should have been blown to smithereens. The Spaniards had no immediate lack of ammunition, for they fired enough to kill the population of four big cities. I admit neither Velasquez nor Cervantes into this discussion, although they have appeared by authority as reasons for something which I do not clearly understand. Well, anyhow, they couldn't hit anything. Velasquez? Yes. Cervantes? Yes. But the Spanish troops seemed only to try to make a very rapid fire. Thus we lost many men. We lost them because of the simple fury of the fire never because the fire was well-directed, intelligent. But the Americans were called upon to be whipped because of Cervantes and Velasquez. It was impossible. Out on the slopes of San Juan, the dog-tents shone white. 
some kind of negotiations were going forward, and men sat on their trousers and waited. It was all rather a blur of talks with officers and a craving for good food and good water. Once Leighton and I decided to ride over to El Caney, into which town the civilian refugees from Santiago were pouring. The road from the beleaguered city to the outlying village was a spectacle to make one moan. There were delicate, gentle families on foot, the silly French boots of the girls twisting and turning in a sort of absolute paper futility. There were sons and grandsons carrying the venerable patriarch in his own armchair. There were exhausted mothers with babes who wailed. There were young dandies with their toilettes in decay. There were puzzled, guideless women who didn't know what had happened. The first sentence one heard was the murmurous, What a damn shame! We saw a godless young trooper of the Second Cavalry sharply halt a wagon. Hold on a minute. You must carry this woman. She's fainted twice already. The virtuous driver of the U.S. Army wagon mildly answered, But I'm full up now. You can make room for her said the private of the second cavalry a young young man with a straight mouth it was merely a plain bit of nothing at all but thank god thank god he seemed to have not the slightest sense of excellence he said if you've got any man in there who can walk at all you pull him out and let this woman get in but answered the teamster i'm filled up with a lot of cripples and grandmothers Thereupon they discussed the point fairly, and ultimately the woman was lifted into the wagon. The vivid thing was the fact that these people did not visibly suffer. Somehow they were numb. There was not a tear. There was rarely a countenance which was not wondrously casual. There was no sign of fatalistic theory. It was simply that what was happening today had happened yesterday, as near as one could judge. I could fancy that these people had been thrown out of their homes every day. It was utterly, utterly casual. And they accepted the ministrations of our men in the same fashion. Everything was a matter of course. I had a filled canteen. I was frightfully conscious of this fact, because a filled canteen was a pearl of price. It was a great thing. It was an enormous accident which led one to offer praises that he was luckier than ten thousand better men. As Leighton and I rode along, we came to a tree under which a refugee family had halted. They were a man, his wife, two handsome daughters, and a pimply son. It was plain that they were superior people, because the girls had dressed for the exodus and wore corsets which captivated their forms with a steel-ribbed vehemence only proper for wear on a sun-blistered road to a distant town. They asked us for water. Water was the gold of the moment. Leighton was almost maudlin in his generosity. I remember being angry with him. He lavished upon them his whole canteen and he received in return not even a glance of what acknowledgment no they didn't even admit anything leighton wasn't a human being he was some sort of a mountain spring they accepted him on a basis of pure natural phenomena his canteen was purely an occurrence in the meantime the pimple-faced approached me he asked for water and held out a pint cup my response was immediate. I tilted my canteen and poured into his cup almost a pint of my treasure. He glanced into the cup, and apparently he beheld there some innocent sediment for which he alone or his people were responsible. In the American camps the men were accustomed to a sediment. Well, he glanced at my poor cupful and then negligently poured it out on the ground and held up his cup for more. I gave him more. I gave him his cup full again, but there was something within me which made me swear him out completely. But he didn't understand a word. Afterward I watched if they were capable of being moved to help on their less able fellows on this miserable journey. Not they, nor yet anybody else. 
Nobody cared for anybody, save my young friend of the 2nd Cavalry, who rode seriously to and fro doing his best for people, who took him as a result of a strange upheaval. The fight at El Caney had been furious. General Vera del Rey, with somewhat less than a thousand men, the Spanish accounts say 520, had there made such a stand that only about eighty battered soldiers ever emerged from it. The attack cost Lawton about four hundred men. The magazine rifle. But the town was now a vast parrot cage of chattering refugees. If on the road they were silent, stolid, and serene, in the town they found their tongues and set up such a cackle as one may seldom hear. Notably the women. It is they who invariably confuse the definition of situations, and one could wonder in amaze if this crowd of irresponsible gabbling hens had already forgotten that this town was the deathbed, so to speak, of scores of gallant men whose blood was not yet dry, whose hands, of the hue of pale amber, stuck from the soil of the hasty burial. On the way to El Caney, I had conjured a picture of the women of Santiago, proud in their pain, their despair, dealing glances of defiance, contempt, hatred at the invader, fiery, ferocious ladies, so true to their vanquished and their dead, that they spurned the very existence of the low-bred churls who lacked both Velasquez and Cervantes and instead there was this mere noise which reminded one alternately of a tea-party in ireland a village fete in the south of france and the vacuous morning screech of a swarm of seagulls good there is doña maria this will lower her high head this will teach her better manners to her neighbours she wasn't too grand to send her rascal of a servant to borrow a trifle of coffee of me in the morning and then when i met her on the calle poor dios she was too blind to see me but we were all equal here no little juan has a sore toe yes doña maria many thanks many thanks Juan, do me the favor to be quiet while Doña Maria is asking about your toe. Oh, Doña Maria, we were always poor, always. But you, my heart bleeds when I see how hard this is for you. The old cat, she gives me a head shake. Pushing through the throng in the plaza, we came in sight of the door of the church, and here was a strange scene. The church had been turned into a hospital for Spanish wounded who had fallen into American hands. The interior of the church was too cave-like in its gloom for the eyes of the operating surgeons, so they had had the altar-table carried to the doorway, where there was a bright light. Framed then in the black archway was the altar-table with the figure of a man upon it. He was naked, save for a breech-clout, and so close, so clear was the ecclesiastic suggestion that one's mind leaped to a fantasy that this thin, pale figure had just been torn down from a cross. The flash of the impression was like light, and for this instant it illumined all the dark recesses of one's remotest idea of sacrilege, ghastly and wanton. I bring this to you merely as an effect, an effect of mental light and shade, if you like, something done in thought similar to that which the French Impressionists do in color, something meaningless and at the same time overwhelming, crushing, monstrous. Poor devil! I wonder if he'll pull through, said Leighton. An American surgeon and his assistants were intent over the prone figure. They wore white aprons. Something small and silvery flashed in the surgeon's hand. An assistant held the merciful sponge close to the man's nostrils, but he was writhing and moaning in some horrible dream of this artificial sleep. As the surgeon's instrument played, I fancied that the man dreamed that he was being gored by a bull. In his pleading, delirious babble occurred constantly the name of the Virgin, the Holy Mother. "'Good morning,' said the surgeon. 
He changed his knife to his left hand and gave me a wet palm. The tips of his fingers were wrinkled, shrunken, like those of a boy who has been in swimming too long. Now, in front of the door, there were three American sentries, and it was their business to... to do what? To keep this Spanish crowd from swarming over the operating table? It was perforce a public clinic. They would not be denied. The weaker women and the children jostled according to their might in the rear, while the stronger people, gaping in the front rank, cried out impatiently when the pushing disturbed their long stares. One burned with a sudden gift of public oratory. One wanted to say, oh, go away, go away, go away. Leave the man decently alone with his pain, you gogglers. This is not the national sport. But within the church there was an audience of another kind. This was of the other wounded men awaiting their turn. They lay on their brown blankets in rows along the stone floor. Their eyes, too, were fastened upon the operating table, but that was different. Meek-eyed little yellow men lying on the floor, awaiting their turns. One afternoon I was seated with a correspondent friend on the porch of one of the houses at Saboni. A vast man on horseback came riding along at a foot-pace. When he perceived my friend, he pulled up sharply. Whoa! Where's that mule I lent you? My friend arose and saluted. I've got him all right, General. Thank you, said my friend. The vast man shook his finger. Don't you lose him now. No, sir, I won't. Thank you, sir. The vast man rode away. Who the devil is that? said I. My friend laughed. That's General Shafter, said he. I gave five dollars for the bosun, small, black, spry imp of Jamaica sin. When I first saw him, he was the property of a fireman on the Cretone. The fireman had found him, a little wharf rat, in Port Antonio. It was not the purchase of a slave. It was that the fireman believed that he had spent about five dollars on a lot of comic supplies for the bosun, including a little suit of sailor clothes. The bosun was an adroit and fantastic black gammon. His eyes were like white lights, and his teeth were a row of little piano keys. Otherwise he was black. He had both been a jockey and a cabin boy, and he had the manners of a gentleman. After he entered my service, I don't think there was ever an occasion upon which he was useful, save when he told me quaint stories of Guatemala, in which country he seemed to have lived some portion of his infantile existence. Usually he ran funny errands like little foot-races, each about fifteen yards in length. At Sibone he slept under my hammock like a poodle, and I always expected that, through the breaking of a rope, I would some night descend and obliterate him. His incompetence was spectacular. When I wanted him to do a thing, the agony of supervision was worse than the agony of personal performance. It would have been easier to have gotten my own spurs or boots or blanket than to have the bother of this little incapable's service. But the good aspect was the humorous view. He was like a boy, a mouse, a scoundrel, and a devoted servitor. He was immensely popular. His name of Bozen became a Saboni stock word. Everybody knew it. It was a name like hmm, President McKinley, Admiral Sampson, General Shafter. The Bozen became a figure. One day he approached me with four one-dollar notes in United States currency. He besought me to preserve them for him, and I pompously tucked them away in my riding breeches with an air which meant that his funds were now as safe as if they were in a national bank. Still, I asked, with some surprise, where he had reaped all this money. He frankly admitted at once that it had been given to him by the enthusiastic soldiery as a tribute to his charm of person and manner. This was not astonishing for Siboni, where money was meaningless. Money was not worth carrying, packing. However, a soldier came to our house one morning and asked, Got any more tobacco to sell? As befitted men in virtuous poverty, we replied with indignation, What tobacco? 
Why, that tobacco what the little nigger is selling round. I said, Bozen. He said, Yes, master. Wounded men on bloody stretchers were being carried into the hospital next door. Bozen, you've been stealing my tobacco. His defense was as glorious as the defense of that forlorn hope in romantic history which drew itself up and mutely died. He lied as desperately, as savagely, as hopelessly as ever man fought. One day a delegation from the 33rd Michigan came to me and said, Are you the proprietor of the Bozen? I said, Yes and they said, Well, would you please be so kind as to be so good as to give him to us? A big battle was expected for the next day. Why, I answered, if you want him, you can have him, but he's a thief, and I won't let him go save on his personal announcement. The big battle occurred the next day, and the bosun did not disappear in it but he disappeared in my interest in the battle, even as a waif might disappear in a fog. My interest in the battle made the bosun dissolve before my eyes. Poor little rascal! I gave him up with pain. He was such an innocent villain. He knew no more of thievery than the whole of it. Anyhow, one was fond of him. He was a natural scoundrel. He was not an educated scoundrel. One cannot bear the educated scoundrel. He was ingenious, simple, honest, abashed ruffianism. I hope the 33rd Michigan did not arrive home naked. I hope the bosun did not succeed in getting everything. If the bosun builds a palace in Detroit, I shall know where he got the money. He got it from the 33rd Michigan. Poor little man! He was only eleven years old. He vanished. I had thought to preserve him as a relic, even as one preserves forgotten bayonets and fragments of shell. And now, as to the pocket of my riding breeches, it contained four dollars in United States currency. Bosun, eh, Bosun, where are you? The morning was the morning of battle. I was on San Juan Hill when Lieutenant Hobson and the men of the Merrimack were exchanged and brought into the American lines. Many of us knew that the exchange was about to be made, and gathered to see the famous party. Some of our staff officers rode out with three Spanish officers, prisoners, these latter being blindfolded before they were taken through the American position. The army was majestically minding its business in the long line of trenches when its eye caught sight of this little procession. "'What's that? What are they going to do? They're going to exchange Hobson.' wherefore every man who was foot-free staked out a claim where he could get a good view of the liberated heroes, and two bands prepared to collaborate on the star-spangled banner. There was a very long wait through the sunshiny afternoon. In our impatience we imagined them, the Americans and Spaniards, dickering away out there under the big tree like so many peddlers. Once the massed bands, misled by a rumor, stiffened themselves into that dramatic and breathless moment when each man is ready to blow, but the rumor was exploded in the nick of time. We made ill jokes, saying one to another that the negotiations had found diplomacy to be a failure and were playing freeze-out poker for the whole batch of prisoners. But suddenly the moment came. Along the cut roadway, toward the crowded soldiers, rode three men, and it could be seen that the central one wore the undress uniform of an officer of the United States Navy. Most of the soldiers were sprawled out on the grass, bored and wearied in the sunshine. However, they aroused at the old circus parade, torchlight procession cry, Here they come! Then the men of the regular army did a thing. They arose en masse and came to attention. Then the men of the regular army did another thing. They slowly lifted every weather-beaten hat and drooped it until it touched the knee. Then there was a magnificent silence, broken only by the measured hoof-beats of the little company's horses as they rode through the gap. It was solemn, funereal, this splendid, silent welcome of a brave man by men who stood on a hill which they had earned out of blood and death, simply 
honestly, with no sense of excellence, earned out of blood and death. Then suddenly the whole scene went to rubbish. Before he reached the bottom of the hill, Hobson was bowing to right and left like another boulanger, and above the thunder of the massed bands one could hear the venerable outbreak, Mr. Hobson, I'd like to shake the hand of the man who— but the real welcome was that welcome of silence. However, one could thrill again when the tail of the procession appeared, an army wagon containing the blue jackets of the Merrimack adventure. I remember grinning heads stuck out from under the canvas cover of the wagon, and the army spoke to the navy. Well, Jackie, how does it feel? And the navy spoke up and answered, Great, much obliged to you fellers for coming here. Say, Jackie, what did they arrest you for, anyhow? Stealing a dog? The Navy still grinned. Here was no rubbish. Here was the mere exchange of language between men. Some of us fell in behind this small but royal procession and followed it to General Shafter's headquarters some miles on the road to Saboni. I have a vague impression that I watched the meeting between Shafter and Hobson, but the impression ends there. However, I remember hearing a talk between them as to Hobson's men, and then the Blue Jackets were called up to hear the congratulatory remarks of the general in command of the Fifth Army Corps. It was a scene in the fine shade of thickly-leaved trees. The general sat in his chair, his belly sticking ridiculously out before him, as if he had adopted some form of artificial inflation. He looked like a joss. If the seamen had suddenly begun to burn a few sticks, most of the spectators would have exhibited no surprise. But the words he spoke were proper, clear, quiet, soldierly. The words of one man to others. The jackies were comic. At the bidding of their officer they aligned themselves before the general, grinned with embarrassment one to the other, made funny attempts to correct the alignment, and looked sheepish. They looked sheepish. They looked like bad little boys, flagrantly caught. They had no sense of excellence. Here was no rubbish. Very soon after this the end of the campaign came for me. I caught a fever. I am not sure to this day what kind of a fever it was. It was defined variously. I know, at any rate, that I first developed a languorous indifference to everything in the world. Then I developed a tendency to ride a horse even as a man lies on a cot. Then I—I I am not sure. I think I groveled and groaned about Saboni for several days. My colleagues, Scoville and George Ree, found me and gave me of their best, but I didn't know whether London Bridge was falling down or whether there was a war with Spain. It was all the same. What of it? Nothing of it. Everything had happened, perhaps, but I cared not a jot. Life, death, dishonor, all were nothing to me. All I cared for was pickles. Pickles at any price. Pickles! If I had been the father of a hundred suffering daughters, I should have waved them all aside and remarked that they could be damned for all I cared. It was not a mood. One can defeat a mood. It was a physical situation. Sometimes one cannot defeat a physical situation. I heard the talk of Saboni, and sometimes I answered, but I was as indifferent as the starfish flung to die on the sands. The only fact in the universe was that my veins burned and boiled. Rhea finally staggered me down to the army surgeon who had charge of the proceedings, and the army surgeon looked me over with a keen, healthy eye. Then he gave a permit that I should be sent home. The manipulation from the shore to the transport was something which was Rhea's affair. I am not sure whether we went in boat or a balloon. I think it was a boat. Rhea pushed me on board, and I swayed meekly and unsteadily towards the captain of the ship, a corpulent, well-conditioned, impickled person, pacing noisily on the spar-deck. Ahem, yes, well, all right. Have you got your own food? I hope, for Christ's sake, you don't expect us to feed you, do you? 
whereupon I went to the rail and weakly yelled at Ray, but he was already afar. The captain was, meantime, remarking in bellows that for Christ's sake I couldn't expect him to feed me. I didn't expect to be fed. I didn't care to be fed. I wished for nothing on earth but some form of painless pause, oblivion. The insults of this old pie-stuffed scoundrel did not affect me then. They affect me now. I would like to tell him that although I like collies, fox terriers, and even screw-curled poodles, I do not like him. He was free to call me superfluous and throw me overboard, but he was not free to coarsely speak to a somewhat sick man. I, in fact, hate him. It is all wrong. I lose whatever ethics I possessed, but I hate him and I demand that you should imagine a milk-cow endowed with a knowledge of navigation and in command of a ship, and perfectly capable of commanding a ship. Oh, well, never mind. I was crawling along the deck when someone pounced violently upon me and thundered, Who in hell are you, sir? I said I was a correspondent. He asked me did I know that I had yellow fever. I said no. He yelled, Well, by God, you isolate yourself, sir. I said, Where? At this question he almost frothed at the mouth. I thought he was going to strike me. Where? he roared. How in hell do I know, sir? I know as much about this ship as you do, sir, but you isolate yourself, sir. My clouded brain tried to comprehend these orders. This man was a doctor in the regular army, and it was necessary to obey him, so I bestirred myself to learn what he meant by those guerrilla outcries. All right, doctor, I'll isolate myself, but I wish you'd tell me where to go. And then he passed into such volcanic humor that I clung to the rail and gasped, Isolate yourself, sir, isolate yourself. That's all I've got to say, sir. I don't give a goddamn where you go, but when you get there, stay there, sir. So I wandered away, and ended up on the deck aft, with my head against the flagstaff, and my limp body stretched on a little rug. I was not at all sorry for myself. I didn't care a tent-peg, and yet, as I look back upon it now, the situation was fairly exciting, a voyage of four or five days before me, no food, no friends, above all else, no friends, isolated on deck and rather ill. When I returned to the United States, I was able to move my feminine friends to tears by an account of this voyage, but after all it wasn't so bad. They kept me on my small reservation aft, but plenty of kindness loomed soon enough. At mess-time they slid me a tin plate of something, usually stewed tomatoes and bread. Men are always good men and at any rate most of the people were in worse condition than I, poor bandaged chaps looking sadly down at the waves. In a way I knew the kind. First lieutenants at forty years of age, captains at fifty, majors at a hundred and two, lieutenant colonels at six hundred and twenty, full colonels at a thousand, and brigadiers at nine million seven hundred sixty-eight thousand two hundred and ninety-five plus. A man had to live two billion years to gain eminent rank in the regular army at that time, and, of course, they all had trembling wives at remote western posts waiting to hear the worst, the best, or the middle. In rough weather the officers made a sort of common pool of all the sound legs and arms, and by dint of hanging hard to each other they managed to move from their deck-chairs to their cabins, and from their cabins again to their deck-chairs. Thus they lived until the ship reached Hampton Roads. We slowed down opposite the curiously mingled hotels and batteries at Old Point Comfort, and at our masthead we flew the yellow flag, the grim ensign of the plague. Then we witnessed something which informed us that with all this shipload of wounds and fevers and starvations we had forgotten the fourth element of war. We were flying the yellow flag, but a launch came and circled swiftly about us. There was a little woman in the launch, and she kept looking and looking and looking. 
Our ship was so high that she could see only those who rung at the rail. But she kept looking and looking and looking. It was plain enough. It was all plain enough. But my heart sank with the fear that she was not going to find him. But presently there was a commotion among some black doughboys of the 24th Infantry, and two of them ran aft to Colonel Liscombe, its gallant commander. Their faces were wreathed in darky grins of delight. "'Colonel, ain't dat Miss Liscombe, Colonel?' "'What?' said the old man. He got up quickly and appeared at the rail, his arm in a sling. He cried, "'Alice!' The little woman saw him, and instantly she covered up her face with her hands as if blinded with a flash of white fire. She made no outcry. It was all in this simply swift gesture, but we, we knew them. It told us. It told us the other part, and in a vision we all saw our own harbor lights, that is to say, those of us who had harbor lights. I was almost well, and had defeated the yellow fever charge which had been brought against me, and so I was allowed ashore among the first. And now happened a strange thing. A hard campaign, full of wants and lacks and absences, brings a man speedily back to an appreciation of things long disregarded or forgotten. In camp, somewhere in the woods between Saboni and Santiago, I happened to think of ice-cream soda. I had done very well without it for many years. In fact, I think I loathe it, but I got to dreaming of ice-cream soda, and I came near dying of longing for it. I couldn't get it out of my mind, try as I would, to concentrate my thoughts upon the land-crabs and mud with which I was surrounded. It certainly had been an institution of my childhood, but to have a ravenous longing for it in the year 1898 was about as illogical as to have a ravenous longing for kerosene. All I could do was to swear to myself that if I reached the United States again I would immediately go to the nearest soda-water fountain and make it look like Spanish fours. In a loud, firm voice I would say, "'Orange, please!' And here is the strange thing. As soon as I was ashore, I went to the nearest soda-water fountain, and in a firm, loud voice I said, "'Orange, please!' I remember one man who went mad that way over tinned peaches, and who wandered over the face of the earth, saying plaintively, "'Have you got any peaches?' Most of the wounded and sick had to be tabulated and marshaled in sections and thoroughly officialized, so that I was in time to take a position on the veranda of Chamberlain's Hotel and see my late shipmates taken to the hospital. The veranda was crowded with women in light, charming summer dresses and with spruce officers from the fortress. It was like a bank of flowers. It filled me with awe. All this luxury and refinement and gentle care and fragrance and color seemed absolutely new. Then across the narrow street on the veranda of the hotel there was a similar bank of flowers. Two companies of volunteers dug a lane through the great crowd in the street and kept the way, and then through this lane there passed a curious procession. I had never known that they looked like that. Such a gang of dirty, ragged, emaciated, half-starved, bandaged cripples I had never seen. Naturally, there were many men who couldn't walk, and some of these were loaded upon a big flat car which was in tow of a trolley car. Then there were many stretchers, slow-moving. When the crowd began to pass the hotel, the banks of flowers made a noise which could make one tremble. Perhaps it was a moan, perhaps it was a sob. But no, it was something beyond either a moan or a sob. Anyhow, the sound of women weeping was in it. The sound of women weeping. And how did these men of famous deeds appear when received thus by the people? Did they smirk and look as if they were bursting with a desire to tell everything which had happened? No. They hung their heads like so many jailbirds. Most of them seemed to be suffering from something which was like stage fright during the ordeal of this chance but supremely eloquent reception. 
No sense of excellence, that was it. Evidently they were willing to leave the clacking to all those natural born major generals who after the war talked enough to make a great fall in the price of that commodity all over the world. The episode was closed, and you can depend upon it that I have told you nothing at all. Nothing at all. Nothing at all. End of section 17